the gospel doctrine argument. And um, I want to think with you a little bit about what that argument looks like if you're not familiar with it. And I want you to think through um, how we should view this biblically here tonight. Just want to examine it with you and critically think about it. Um, there is clearly a distinction between the two terms, gospel and doctrine, and there are two Greek words that are translated into two English words, um, and so we must admit that, that they are two separate words and have two separate meanings, but some, I believe, have separated these two terms, gospel and doctrine, to the point that they have begun to make unwarranted assumptions and assertions that pull these two terms into completely separate and mutually exclusive categories without any overlap. And I believe that there are motives for doing so. So let me give you the basic gist of the argument. We could go back and quote old preachers and the history of this argument, and there are some guys who have written on this that have done so pretty capably. And if you're interested in more of that history, I could share some of those articles and things with you. Um, so you can dig and delve a little bit deeper. This isn't really a new argument. This is something that's been um, was argued a lot in the 90s, and before that, it was it was argued decades before. It just kind of old arguments tend to resurface. But some argue basically that the gospel is only the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and they make that argument based on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and. What they would argue is that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and our belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is an essential matter of salvation. Now, I would agree it is an essential matter of salvation that we believe in um, the virgin birth, uh, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, but meanwhile, the argument goes that doctrine, the term doctrine, refers to everything else that Jesus or the apostles taught and that everything else that Jesus or the apostles taught are non-essentials to salvation. And so essentially anything outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gets thrown into the, the Romans 14 loophole. You can hold your conviction and I can hold my conviction and it doesn't matter what our convictions are. Those are just all opinion matters to some. This really is what the community church movement is built upon, but we're, we're starting to see the community church movement and the arguments behind the community church movement um, infiltrate the church. And I will say that after I posted this, I, I had many people um, who appreciated what I said, some didn't. I had a preacher um, just send me a message last night saying that they're looking forward to hearing tonight's lesson because uh, a congregation that they were a part of for a long time, uh, just 30 members just left that group and are meeting in their house now um, over this issue. So this is an important issue. It's an issue that's being talked about and conversed in different congregations here in Indiana, and I think we need to be familiar with it. Um, the gospel, though, as we further think about the arguments, the gospel to some is the story of Jesus that's contained in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's how they would define the gospel. However, to some, the doctrine is just a bunch of man-made ideas and religious traditions that are fallible and that are non-binding and that are non-essential. Now, the reason why this has consequences is that some claim that all that matters for fellowship with one another as Christians is our agreement on the gospel, which to them is just the death beyond resurrection. As long as we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, to them, that is the only thing that matters for us to have fellowship with one another, and no other detail of doctrine is significant, at least with regards to our fellowship. Contrary to these beliefs, the gospel and doctrine often are inextricably linked together in the Scriptures. And that's what I want to point out to you tonight. Now, let's be clear about something that I do think should be pointed out. There is an order in which we are to teach the lost. I'm not going to start teaching the lost, you know, the importance of, you know, not using instrumental music or, 
uh, arguing with them about things like that when they do not yet believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, when they do not understand the authority of Jesus Christ because he has been risen from the dead. And so there is an order in which we should teach the lost as we're teaching people. So I do not deny that. There is, in Scripture, such a concept as first principles and secondary principles. And you see it referred to just like that, the elementary principles and then the secondary principles in the book of Hebrews. And we have to teach the first principles before we can teach the second principles, if we're going to teach with understanding to those we teach. You have to start with the milk before we can add meat to the diet. And again, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 6 points that out. But he also points out, you need to get to the point where you get to the meat. And you need to not just survive on the milk. You need to mature, and you need to get to the secondary principles. But because there is an order to effective teaching doesn't mean the first principles are the only ones that matter, and secondary principles are irrelevant or can be dismissed as inessential issues. Likewise, just because the term gospel may in one passage refer to the initial message that Paul preached, does not mean that the doctrine that he would continue to teach and write about does not matter. And what I want you to see is just a few places where we see these terms, gospel and doctrine, tied together, not separated and mutually exclusive, but tied together so that we can consider why this is a matter of importance. One of the first places you're going to see them tied together is actually in the Sermon on the Mount. They are tied together at the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, that occurred before the death, the burial, or the resurrection of Jesus. One of the things it said in Matthew chapter 4, and I'm not going to have all the verses on your screen, and so you're going to have to turn to them in your Bibles if you want to follow along with me today. But in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says Jesus, he's beginning his ministry here, and after his temptation, it says he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Well, what was he teaching when he was teaching the gospel of the kingdom? I would suggest to you that it actually wasn't necessarily his death, burial, and resurrection. We do see references where he referred to that specifically just mostly to his apostles and his closest disciples when he does refer to it. But if you want to know what he was teaching when he was teaching the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7 is a very good sampling as to what he was teaching. And so if you look at that sampling, you'll find um, in his Sermon on the Mount, that's the content of what he was teaching when he was teaching the gospel. Well, what does that include? Well, it includes the Beatitudes about the important qualities that we need to possess if we're kingdom people. We need to be poor in spirit. We need to mourn. We need to be meek. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness, be merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers, and be willing to be persecuted. He tells people they need to shine their good light, and they need to be salt, and they need to be light. Then he gets into, when you start reading down into verse 21, he talks about anger. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom, that you need to learn to control your anger, that you not act upon your anger. You need to work on your heart. He talks about adultery, and he talks about sexual immorality in Matthew chapter 5. He talks about lust. That's part of the gospel. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom that he was preaching. He talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage in verses 31 and 32. And so that's part of the gospel of the kingdom. As you continue, he talks about honesty and not swearing falsely. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom. You move on down, he talks about how we should treat our enemies. Um, as you look at verse 43, love your enemy. Don't hate them. Uh, love even your enemies, just as God loves us. What else does he talk about? He talks about how we should handle our charitable deeds, not to practice them before men. He talks about how we should handle our prayer, how we should handle our fasting, not to be praying so that we can be seen, not to fast so that we can be seen, but because we want to have a private relationship with God because God will see us in secret. We don't have to self-promote through those things. He talks about other things as you continue through Matthew chapter 6. He talks about what we do with our money. He talks about how spiritual treasures are a greater priority than our earthly treasures, and that we shouldn't be people of greed, focus on earthly treasures. As you continue, he says we shouldn't be worried. As long as we seek first the kingdom of God, he's going to provide for us what we need. And then you get into chapter 7, he talks about how we should be careful about judging one another hypocritically or hypercritically, 
in Matthew chapter 7. And then as you continue through Matthew chapter 7, he warns that we need to be aware of dogs and we need to be aware of hogs. And don't cast your pearls before swine um, because they'll just trample your pearls under their feet. He talks about other things there, about how we need to discern between good fruit and bad fruit. We, we need to discern between wolves who are in sheep's clothing. And then he says that there are going to be some people who call upon him and say, Lord, Lord, who will not enter the kingdom of heaven because they did not do his will. That's the gospel of the kingdom. That's the gospel message that Jesus was teaching. And it sure sounds to me like there's a lot of doctrine in it. If you look at chapter 7 and verse 28, actually, the gospel itself tells you that. It says, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his King James word is doctrine, the new King James teaching. It's the same word. He's astonished at his teaching. So the gospel is doctrine. The good news of Jesus Christ is that there, um, he shows us the right way to live so that we can be pleasing to him. And so the gospel, if you'll look at these texts and notice that he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and that people were astonished at the teaching of that gospel, the gospel included doctrine. This could not have been the death, burial, and resurrection yet because it hadn't happened yet. Um, so part of the gospel is certainly doctrinal teaching. We need to teach on morals, ethics, right and wrong, marriage, divorce, remarriage. Those are issues that Jesus taught about. And if Jesus taught about those things, we need to be teaching on those things as well. But we're also going to see a connection between the gospel and doctrine in Paul's letters to the churches. And I believe that Gospel and doctrine are tied together in Paul's letters to churches. In Romans, for example, look at Romans chapter 1. We're just going to look at three letters, um, letters to churches, and then we're going to look at some letters to evangelists. Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, says in verse 15, As much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Clearly, Paul wanted to teach and preach the gospel. He was a debtor to the gospel. It says, um, however, does the gospel include doctrine? Does he also talk about doctrine as he writes to Rome? Well, he does. In fact, if you look at Romans 16 and verse 17, he actually says in the same letter where he says, I, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. He says, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. In the same letter that he talks about his excitement for the gospel, he also warns about the reality that some people will not accept the doctrine that he has delivered. Um, <clears throat> Does Paul teach the death, burial, and resurrection in Romans, in the, in the book of Romans? Well, if you look at Romans chapter 6, clearly he does. Take a look at verses 3 through 6. Romans chapter 6, 3 through 6. We, we should be pretty familiar with this, right? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through the baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we've been united together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. All right. So do we have there, as some would say, the gospel, as 1 Corinthians 15 defines it, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? We do. What else do we have? We also have the death of us to our own sins, our burial in water, which is water baptism, and then our raising up to be to walk in newness of life. Now, is it just called the gospel? I would suggest to you it's not just called the gospel in Romans 6. In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 6 and in verse 17, it says, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. The good news of Jesus Christ, that he's died and he's been buried and he's been raised and that we can die to ourselves and be buried to be raised, that is considered gospel and it is also considered doctrine. 
And by the way, baptism is included in that doctrine. Some would like to exclude baptism as one of those non-essentials, inessentials. We don't need to argue about whether you need to be baptized or not. We just need to believe that, that Jesus died, buried, and was a rose. Well, this passage connects baptism to that doctrine, which was part of that gospel message. Take a look at another passage in the book of Galatians, in the book of Galatians, in the letter to Galatia. In the book of Galatians, Paul is shocked. You start out that, that first chapter, pretty familiar verse, verses 6 through 9. He says, I am shocked that some of you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And then he goes on to say, it's not another, though. There are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven and preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you receive, let him be accursed. We are not to um, allow the preaching of any other gospel message. And yet, as we read the book of Galatians, we realize that Paul taught on other things besides just and rebukes Galatia for other things besides just uh, death, burial, and resurrection issues. If you took a take a look at Galatians chapter 2, look at verses 11 through 14. Does Paul deal with a doctrinal issue? Does he find this doctrinal issue to be pretty important? Well, look at verses 11 through 14. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Why? Because he was denying the resurrection? No, there must have been some other issue that mattered besides just the death, burial, and resurrection to Paul that he rebuked Peter. He says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. He calls out two men. He calls out two men over matters that, according to this gospel doctrine argument that people are making, would be non-essentials, would be unimportant. But Paul found them to be important. They were doctrinal issues. And they were doctrinal issues that deserved a rebuke, a face-to-face -face rebuke for having left the doctrine of Christ. And so it says in verse 14, when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. What was the truth of the gospel? That Jesus died for both Jews and Gentiles, and we should not be ashamed to have a relationship with the Jews or the Gentiles as the result. And he was showing partiality to the Jews over the Gentiles when people would come. And so this doctrinal issue was something that Paul felt needed to be addressed and needed to be rebuked. If the gospel includes only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and no other doctrinal issue really matters, then why does this particular issue matter? In fact, it's connected to the gospel because he was showing partiality. In fact, let's get a little deeper into Galatians and look at Galatians 5. And you see this list in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, where we begin to realize that this gospel that Paul preached included a lot more than just the death, death, burial, and resurrection. It included teaching on moral, doctrinal issues, like what we find in verses 19 through 21. The works of the flesh are evident. They are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like. These are doctrinal issues that matter. These are moral issues that matter. And Paul addressed them because of that. Um, now, here's what I want you to think about as we think about people defining the gospel as just a death, burial, and a resurrection, and any other thing matters. When we die, when we die, Okay, we go through our death, burial, and resurrection. What do we die to? We die to ourselves. We die to our sins. How do I know how to die to my sins if I do not preach and teach about what sin is? And I do not teach doctrine. And so once we realize that the gospel dying to ourselves and then being buried and then living a new life and living for Jesus, that it includes learning about sin so that I can overcome it and avoid it, then it completely obliterates this whole gospel doctrine distinction that people are trying to make. Uh, look at Galatians 2 and verse 20, and I think we see this emphasized. Galatians 2 and verse 20, over and over again, Paul makes this point that 
that part of the gospel is, and part of me living the gospel, is I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I've been crucified. Crucified to what? Sin. How do I know what sin is? If somebody doesn't teach me doctrine about what sin is, what, what wrong is and what right is, and what error is and what truth is. I can't die to my sin if someone doesn't teach me what the sin is. Look at Galatians 5 and verse 24. After he talks about the works of the flesh, and then he contrasts it with the fruit of the Spirit. And talk, he's basically saying, here's the things you shouldn't do. Here's the things you should be doing if you're walking by the Spirit. Verse 24 says, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I've crucified the flesh. How do I know what's fleshly? Well, he just told me in the doctrine that he's writing about things that are works of the flesh. These are fleshly things you've got to crucify, put behind you. Look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me. How do I know how to crucify the world to myself? If I don't understand what the world is, 1 John tells me what the world is, right? Talks about the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life. These are the things that are of the world. But if I don't teach on doctrinal issues, then I don't know what the world is. And I don't know how to crucify myself to it. I don't know how to live out the gospel if I don't have doctrine. And so I've got to have the doctrine of Christ taught to me so that I can be crucified with Christ. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15 now. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is where Paul speaks of the gospel which I preached to you. And this would be kind of the key proof text in chapter 15 that, again, I think is the, the first principles that we need to teach. Every time the apostles went in the book of Acts and they began trying to plant churches in new cities and convert people to Jesus Christ, they were teaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They started there. Certainly started to begin to teach other things beyond that, but that's where they started to win people to Jesus. And so that's what Paul's saying. I declare to you, chapter 15 and verse 1, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. And this gospel message is a salvation issue for sure, because he says, you're saved by it. If, though, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, there's an if. You've got to do something. There's some involvement on your part. You've got to hold fast to the word that was preached. Well, what's the word that was preached? I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, Christ died for our sins. Again, this goes back to the fundamental question. This is the gospel, that Christ died for your sins. But I've got to hold fast to the word of that gospel. How do I do that? Well, I've got to know what sin is. And I don't know what sin is if somebody doesn't teach me, give me some teaching about what sin is so I can die to it. Christ died for our sins, so we could be forgiven of those sins, so we could overcome those sins. And that he was buried, verse 4, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And by the way, that argument that I made about dying to our sins, that we find in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that we find also David McClister, I think, made that argument very well in an article that's, that's online. And um, David teaches down at Florida College, and I'd be glad to share that article with you because he did a very succinct job of responding to that particular point. But in 1 Corinthians, the gospel that he preaches includes Jesus dying for our sins. And we can't know how to die to ourselves, or repent of our sins, unless we are taught the doctrines which define and distinguish sin from righteousness. So once we realize that the gospel is tied to doctrine in this way, then it really makes the possibility of a mutually exclusive gospel and doctrine, it makes it foolishness. They're tied, they're linked. They're also tied together in Paul's letters to the evangelists. So we see it, I believe, in the teaching of Jesus. When he preaches the gospel of the kingdom, it included doctrine. We see it in Paul's letter to the churches. We see the gospel being tied to doctrinal teaching. But we also see it in Paul's letters to evangelists. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And this right here, um, if there was an open and shut proof text, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, would probably be the clearest one. The one that if you were to take one verse home, so that you could try to talk to other people about how the gospel and doctrine are synonymous terms, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 10 and 11 would be the verse you want to take home. It says, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, now he's talked about fornicators and sodomy and kidnapping and lying and perjury. 
He says, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, and notice verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Do you see how he connects the doctrine in verse 10? The same sentence, there's no period in a new sentence. They're not disjointed, disconnected. The doctrine of verse 10 is connected to the glorious gospel of verse 11. And if you're living in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're also respecting the doctrine and teaching of Jesus Christ on certain moral issues, such as those that he's addressed in verses 9 and 10. In fact, take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. And Paul, as he preaches the gospel and encourages Timothy to preach the gospel, he tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 3, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words... Now, he's just taught on a whole variety of things in 1 Timothy. Right, if we were to scan the, the first Timothy text and just kind of walk back through it in chapter 2, he talks about proper prayer. In chapter 2, he talks about modesty. In chapter 2, he talks about the role of men and the role of women, the role of husbands, the role of wives. In chapter 3, he talks about the qualifications for elders and for deacons. In chapter 4, he talks about people who are trying to forbid you from eating certain foods. He talks about the example that a young man should set who's going to be a man who's not despised for his youth. Chapter 5, he gives us principles for how you should treat older men, older women, uh, brothers and sisters who are your age. And then he talks to us and gives us very specific principles about how we handle widows, younger widows, older widows, widows who have family who can take care of them, widows that don't have family who take care of them. That sounds like a whole lot of doctrinal teaching. Now, did that doctrinal teaching matter, or was that just good advice? Well, when you read 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not... Cons otherwise than what? Other than what he's taught in the first five chapters. If anybody says, no, that's how Paul said to do it as an inspired apostle, but, but you can do it this way. That's inessential. That's doctrine. And we can disagree on doctrine. We can do doctrine different. No, we can, we can go ahead and have w women preachers. That's okay. Modesty doesn't really matter. That's, that's old school stuff, just cultural stuff. You don't need to worry about the qualifications of elders and deacons. Now, we move beyond those qualifications. There are people completely ignoring all of those qualifications today. There, 1 Timothy chapter 5. You know, we, we get to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And, that's okay. We don't really need to follow these rules about widows. We can go ahead and set up the institutions and the widows' homes and the orphans' homes, and that's okay because that's what Paul said. That was his opinion about doctrine in the first century, but we can do things differently today. Paul writes, If somebody teaches you otherwise, it is not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but he is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strive for violent, evil suspicions. And then in verse 5, he says, from such withdraw yourself. Withdraw yourself. These things he wrote about to these evangelists, and he told these evangelists to teach about, mattered and needed to be taught on without disagreement from those who were hearing, with all authority, as he would say to Titus. And Titus also was informed of doctrinal matters which would be extremely important for both elders and preachers. Turn over to Titus and just notice a couple verses, and then we're going to draw this to a close here in just a moment. But in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, what does he say about elders? One of the roles of elders is they need to be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine. Elders need to be people who know doctrine who know teaching, who hold fast to it, so they can exhort and convict those who contradict by sound doctrine. Chapter 2 and verse 1, evangelists need to be people. And as you consider an evangelist and consider someone to work with you as an evangelist, rule number one, first and foremost, above and beyond anything and everything, the ultimate litmus test, is do they preach the truth? Chapter 2 and verse 1 says, As for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. You, Titus, preach sound doctrine. You, Titus, make sure that you appoint elders who know sound doctrine so they can exhort and convict those who contradict. Now, if Paul thought, as some people seem to represent him as thinking, 
that doctrine doesn't matter, doctrine isn't essential and isn't important. We can disagree about those things. He really doesn't seem to give me the impression of that when I read these verses. Does he you? So where is some of this coming from? Maybe it's coming a little bit from our motives and our agendas and our desire to teach people with itching ears that they don't have to worry about doctrine anymore, just the basics. Because we're tired of arguing and we're tired of contending for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. And it's just a whole lot easier if we don't have to do that. But it's not biblical. And it's not the ways of the New Testament church. And so we've got to stand for truth, for the gospel, and for doctrine. In fact, what I want to conclude by having you consider is that various terms are used interchangeably to refer to the same system of truth, basically. For example, look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, and you'll notice that the faith and the gospel are used in the exact same text. So when we refer to the faith, we're also referring to the gospel. And when we refer to the gospel, we're many times referring to the faith. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith, the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Notice how he just seems to use those two terms interchangeably. When you practice and live by the faith, you're also living for the gospel, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. You don't have to look at it. We already looked at it, but if you want to look at it again, you can. Verses 10 and 11, sound doctrine, used in the same sentence as the gospel. He seems to use these terms interchangeably. Not like they're two totally different terms, but they're synonymous with one another. Then take a look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 5. It says they weren't honest about the truth of what? The gospel. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 5, then Galatians chapter 2 and verse 14, the truth and the gospel are used interchangeably again. Here's what I want you to see more than anything, and that is if people are trying to get you to say you don't have to be obedient to the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the truth, the faith, then they're teaching you something that isn't consistent with what the Bible teaches. Because obedience to God's will is demanded regardless of which term is used. The gospel and the doctrine must be obeyed. Take a look at a couple others, just real quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 8. I don't have this in my bulletin outline, so I added this um, after those went to press. So if you want some of these verses, I can give these to you as well. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 8, it says, In flaming fire, God is going to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very serious verse. If you do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says there's going to be vengeance taken upon you. But look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. And notice how there's a very similar phrase in verse 17. God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. In one sentence he says you obeyed the doctrine. Another sentence he says you need to obey the gospel. These terms are used interchangeably in Scripture. The faith and the truth must be obeyed. Look at some more. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. I just want you to see how in different passages he just phrases it slightly differently. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. The word of God spread. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The faith. People obeyed the faith. But in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. Notice in Romans chapter 1, you'll notice at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, it says in Romans 1, 5, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. Then look at the last chapter. We obey the faith, not just the gospel, not just the doctrine. We also obey the faith according to these passages. Romans chapter 16 and verse 26. Now, see, it talks about the gospel has been made manifest and the prophetic scriptures have been made, made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. He says, I'm ready to preach the gospel. 
What's the gospel? I want you to obey the faith. What else is the gospel? I also want you to obey that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You see the faith, the truth, the gospel, all these things. Used interchangeably in Scripture. We try to make a big deal as if they're completely different and opposite and um, polar concepts. Um, consequences will follow to those who do not obey the gospel. Consequences will follow to those who do not obey the doctrine of Christ, according to 2 John 9 through 11. Consequences will follow to those who do not obey the truth, according to Romans chapter 2 and verse 8. These terms are all used synonymously. So don't let somebody feed you the idea that you don't have to be obedient to the will of God, to the doctrine of Christ, to the truth of the gospel, to the faith. I have to be. I have to be. And that's part of the gospel. The good news includes the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And that is good news because he frees me from my sin. And to do so, he shows me what sin is, what his expectations are, how he wants me to live. And it's good news that I don't have to just try to figure it out by myself without any guidance. I have the truth. I have the system of faith delivered. I have the gospel that's been preached through the inspired word of the apostles, and I can consult it and see it and know what I can do to be pleasing to God. What do I need to crucify and change, and what do I need to live for as I live for you, God? And that should be comforting to us as Christians. Um, well, <clears throat> we're out we're out of time, and we could talk about this a whole lot more. And if you want to talk about it a whole lot more, I do say I'm, I'm glad to do so. Um, I'm glad to do so. And I say that not just to you as an audience, but to anybody who might be listening online when this gets posted, if it gets posted and is recorded. Um, I'm always happy to talk more about Scripture and to delve a little bit more deeply into it. But for means of our conclusion here today, I want you to go back to Romans 6. And if you're not a Christian, I want you to think about gospel that's been taught by Paul is that Jesus died, he buried, he was resurrected, and that we die to ourselves once we realize our sinful ways. We're buried with him. We're raised with him to walk in newness of life. And when we make that decision to give up the old man of sin, to continue learning what sin and righteousness is and live for him, then we have obeyed that form of doctrine to which we have been delivered. No longer living as slaves of sin, but living as servants of righteousness and obedience to Jesus Christ.